Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for a special webinar on Reigniting the Spark, Advanced Treatments in Sexual Health for Men and Women. My name is Britt with Forum Health. We are an expanding nationwide network of industry-leading healthcare providers who serve patients with a root cause approach to care. Our practitioners have decades of functional and integrative medicine experience drawn from areas in clinical nutrition, anti-aging, environmental medicine, chronic disease, lifestyle medicine, and so much more. For more information, visit us at forumhealth.com. All right, let's get started. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Connie Casebolt from our Greenville, South Carolina location, and Elise Clark from our Irving, Texas clinic. Dr. Casebolt is a graduate of Loma Linda University School of Medicine and has been board certified in family medicine since 1985. Her book, Wellness by Design, dispels common health myths and was endorsed by Ellen DeGeneres, Jimmy Kimmel, and Suzanne Summers. Dr. Casebolt's passion is fixing the root cause of disease, which has led her to develop expertise in many functional and integrative treatment modalities. And Elise Clark is a certified family nurse practitioner who graduated with honors from Texas Women's University. During her time as an, with an OBGYN clinic, she saw firsthand that she could help people feel better and elevate their lives with hormones. Her focus is treating patients holistically, incorporating nutrition and disease prevention. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. You know, sexual health is such an important aspect of overall wellness, and many experience challenges in this area at some point in their lives. Uh, that's why we're excited to share with you some of the most innovative and effective functional medicine treatments available today. Whether you're seeking to enhance your sexual health or maybe address a specific concern, this webinar is designed to help you unlock your full potential and reignite your spark. So Dr. Casebolt, to start off, what are the most common sexual health concerns and conditions in men and women, particularly as they age? So what my patients tell me, um, and some of this is more women than men, they'll come in and say, I have low libido. I love my husband, but I don't want him to touch me. Um, and they don't know how to regain that spark. Um, other, another concern, of course, unique to women, is vaginal dryness, which is very much a hormone deprivation uh, symptom. And then men, of course, can have erectile dysfunction, super common, we'll be talking more about that as the evening progresses. I should have mentioned low libido can also occur in men. It's a little more common in women, but it can occur in men as well. So these are the main concerns. Um, and I suppose I could throw in fatigue, that's not really a sexual concern, but if you're tired, nothing looks very interesting if you're too tired to, to do anything. No, that makes sense. And Elise, I'm curious, what are some of the main causes of sexual dysfunction that you're finding in men and women? A lot of times it can be hormone related, um, especially around that menopausal area for women. Um, it's commonly between late 40s, early 50s, when we really start to see the hormones dip drastically, but you can really see hormone deficiency symptoms even before that. So it's not just about testosterone, um, it's also about progesterone and estrogen balance in women. And then of course in men, their main hormone is estrogen, or I'm sorry, not estrogen, it's testosterone. Um, so hormone imbalance is one of the main things that we treat related to this area of concern, um, but lifestyle plays a big role. If you are overweight, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, don't sleep well, I mean, those are some pretty big contributing factors as well. Absolutely. And Elise, you mentioned hormone imbalance. Can you talk to us about hormone replacement therapy to maybe correct hormone imbalances? What is it and, and how does it work? Yeah, so um, in women, there are, are three primary hormones that are made in the ovaries, the estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And when you know, we're young and vital and reproductive years, those are at really high normal levels. And in some women who have other conditions, they're not always optimal even at young ages. And so we can balance those out for them. Um, but there are very safe and effective ways to replace all three of those or one or two of them as needed, depending on your age and stage of life. 
So that's what we mean by hormone balancing is your levels might look normal. Say you're 35, but just had a child and your progesterone levels don't ever quite get back up to where they used to be. We can add in a little bit of something like progesterone to balance you back out. And while that's not commonly thought of as a hormone for libido, it's about the balancing of all three, as opposed to one hormone does this and that's all it does. Um, and I think a big thing that Dr. Casewell mentioned that's true as well is the fatigue. And so making sure that someone's thyroid hormones are optimized, again, not just in normal limits, but at the upper ends of normal, because if you are tired, there's not room for extra stuff in your life. Um, and the same goes for men with their thyroid. And then particularly for them, our primary focus with hormones is going to be testosterone replacement because their middle life hormone changes don't get as much talk as women do, but men often go through a dip in their testosterone as well. And what I find is a lot of men's libido and sexual concerns can also be addressed with lifestyle. Like if you're gaining too much weight, men can actually accumulate too much estrogen, which then impacts their testosterone. And so lifestyle ends up playing a really big role in both men and women as well. And I'm sure, I know our audience is probably curious, how effective is this type of therapy? And what are some of the benefits and, and the results that patients can expect? I would say it's very effective. Um, it's kind of the bread and butter of what I do and what we do in our clinic. So, you know, with women and men, per, uh, addressing whichever hormone they're in need of, it does help not only with things like fatigue and weight maintenance, and then as a byproduct, things like libido get better, but we want people to feel better day to day with their energy and their mood and their overall vitality. But a big push for us in using hormones is disease prevention. Mm -hmm. So all those hormones I mentioned are wonderful for preventing the big things that we struggle with, like heart disease and Alzheimer's and dementia and, and women osteoporosis. So, you know, our approach is really twofold. We want you to physically feel better day to day, but we also want to keep you living really well for a long time. And so there's different ways to do those. And for estrogen, there's patches and pills and pellets. Um, progesterone has to be done orally. So we always do that as a pill, sometimes as a cream. And then testosterone for men and women um, can be done as creams or injectables or pellets. So there's lots of different modalities for us to deliver it. And we tailor it to each person, their lifestyle. And more than that, what's the most effective for each individual? That's great. And I, I know you've probably helped so many people, men and women, just with hormone therapy to, to feel normal again and to feel rejuvenated. Um, yeah, that's what we hear a lot. I got my life yeah. back a little bit. Yeah, right. You get your life back. That's truly yeah. what it is. I've heard so many people say that. Yeah. Dr. Casebolt, you know, so many women experience painful intercourse, urinary incontinence, uh, vaginal dryness, as you mentioned earlier. Um, they're maybe just not in the mood as they age and start their menopause journey. What are some of the best treatments for women who want a better sex life as they start to age? So let's talk about the painful intercourse and vaginal dryness. That's almost always a symptom of low estrogen. Um, so if they are a candidate, and the vast majority of women are, but there's a few women who are not candidates for hormone replacement therapy, but if they are a candidate, then we want to get them some estrogen. And we can do all the methods that she mentioned. There's a few women that I might even recommend in the beginning, some vaginal estrogen, just to kind of kickstart the process. Um, it's interesting, but testosterone can also somewhat help uh, vaginal epithelium, although estrogen is the, is the main player. Um, urinary incontinence is partly estrogen deprivation, partly aging, partly how many babies have come through that birth canal. Um, it's a function also of poor muscle tone, and it's actually surprisingly common. Um, I just had a patient yesterday who asked, she says, I'm asking for a friend. Uh, she started to sneeze or cough and she wet her pants and she was so embarrassed. 
Um, and it's really fortunate that we do have some therapies for that. So I would say that for all of these, the painful intercourse, vaginal dryness, the urinary incontinence, and just not in the mood, the foundational where we start is with hormone replacement therapy. And sometimes that's enough. You know, that sometimes that'll be enough for these women to get enough improvements in their quality of life, et cetera. Um, however, it's not 100% effective for everyone. Uh, so we do have some modalities, and I'm not sure if they're in other offices. So right now I'm going to talk about what we have in our office. We have a therapy called the FemiWave. It actually uses a shockwave device, uh, which we'll allude to later when we talk about men and their sexual health. So it, it's a shock wave that we apply right around the clitoral area and it can actually revitalize the tissue, break up micro plaque. You know, women can get uh, circulation problems just like men. So in order for a woman, for example, to have an orgasm, she has to have good circulation to the clitoris and the same thing goes for a man. Uh, so women can get plaque buildup in their circulation just like uh, men. And so the Femi wave can just rejuvenate tissue break up the micro plaque and just improve the health of the whole area. It's uh, painless. Um, each session is about 15 to 17 minutes. And we normally recommend um, anywhere from three to six sessions for women. We have another standalone technology that I just love. It's called the Emcella. Now this is uh, a chair that you sit on fully clothed so you don't have to take your clothes off. Um, and we do put it in a private room just so people can have some privacy. They can play on their phone or read a book if they want. It's a 28 minute treatment, completely non-painful where you sit and there's actually a Tesla coil of energy that comes up through the middle and is designed to passively stimulate your pelvic muscles. So everyone has heard of Kegel exercises. So a Kegel exercise is when you voluntarily squeeze and relax and squeeze and relax the muscles that control your bladder and this uh, activity is really like any kind of exercise you're trying to build up your muscle tone so that you can better control uh, your ability to urinate when you're supposed to and not when you're not supposed to so the Amcella does it passively for you but what's cool about this it actually the contractions that it's producing are four times as strong as what you could achieve on your own and also it will do 11,000 contractions in that 28 minute so there's nothing that you could do on your own that could even begin to match it it's actually so effective that it is an FDA approved device for incontinence so what we typically see it's a similar treatment schedule we have women come in twice a week for three weeks, and that typically will get them to a level of improvement. And then they might need to come in once every, who knows, one to two to three months just for a little booster treatment to kind of maintain. Um, so just like any muscle, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so this having a little booster treatment is helpful to kind of maintain. Uh, so that's the Amcella. Now, we actually recommend the Amcella for two reasons. It can be helpful for incontinence in both men and women, but because all of the muscles are, that are in that area also control orgasmic response, they can actually enhance the sexual experience. So uh, we have women that come in and they don't necessarily have incontinence, but they just want to enhance their ability to enjoy sex. And so they'll do a similar series of treatments and um, they say it's, it's very uh, beneficial and their partners will probably notice a tightening effect. So it actually makes it more pleasurable for both partners, for the woman to have the Encella treatment. Uh, for men, it's actually beneficial to the prostate and also for male sexual response. So for men, it can be uh, somewhat of a treatment for ED. And the nice thing about our Encella, it's non-invasive. You don't have to get undressed. You know, there's no needles and um, it can be for both men and women. And then last, I wanna talk about the vaginal shot. Um, we call it our vaginal rejuvenation shot. And this uses a product called PRP. Now PRP has been in the news. Um, it's a rejuvenation product that we harvest from the patient. So it starts by putting a tourniquet on you. We then draw your blood. My uh, lab tech then goes through a process where 
uh, we spin off and discard the red blood cells and the white blood cells, and what's left is what's called platelet-rich plasma. And that is a specialty product. So platelets um, have granules in them. And what we do during the PRP prep process is we are going to do some things to cause it to degranulate. So the platelets are going to spill open and that degranulation process unleashes a rejuvenatory response. It attracts stem cells, which we know can rebuild. It attracts healing factors all kinds of things that will cause rejuvenation. So when we do the vaginal shot for women, here's how it starts. First of all, blood is drawn. Uh, of course, we have you sign the consent. And while the, the prep is being done, we have the woman apply a little bit of numbing cream at the two areas that we're going to inject. So those two areas are the clitoris, which sounds painful, but with the numbing cream, also we use a little bit of numbing medication. It's really not. I've had this done, so that might be too much information, but I like to know what I'm talking about when I talk to patients. Uh, and then we're gonna put it in what people call the G-spot, which is actually considered to be an extension um, of the clitoris. So uh, the woman is numbing, and then we bring in our PRP, and then we put a little bit of numbing into the um, little lidocaine into the clitoris. We follow with the PRP, and then we put a little bit more PRP into that G-spot. Now, it just so happens that the G-spot is not only for, of course, sexual pleasure, but it's right in the area where the um, urethra is leaving the bladder to travel out. It plumps up that area, and it kind of changes the angle of the urethra leaving the bladder meaning that the woman is gonna have more control. So it's improving the angle. It's also just plumping up the tissue. It has a rejuvenatory effect on the entire vagina. So it can actually address vaginal dryness. It's gonna make the entire vagina just more plump and moist and youthful. Uh, so a lot of people ask how often they can do these things. Um, you know, this is a rejuvenatory process, but as we age, we degenerate. So we need to regenerate periodically. So a lot of women will come in once a year for the vaginal shot, just like they might come in for booster treatments on the Mcella. Uh, so that's kind of our uh, enhancements for women. Um, that's what I have to say about women. So I'm sure you have more questions for me. <laughs> I do, and I have to say, I love that all of those options are drug-free non-invasive and virtually painless. I know, of course, you numb with the, uh, with the vaginal shot, but um, I love that those options are available to women and very effective too. So yes. Dr. Yes. Casebolt, I wanna to talk to you about the guys. We don't wanna forget about the guys. Yes. Um, you know, 52% of men, it's reported, experience some form of erectile dysfunction after age 40. I'm curious as to why this is a common condition and what do you feel are the best treatments for it? So it's common, and again, it gets more common with age, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, as my co-host has already mentioned, as men age, their testosterone levels tend to go down. Um, and also as, as they age, they tend to get worse circulation. Um, so I always tell my men, if you, in order for the penis to function, it's got to have a nerve supply, which is not the problem with most men. So the only men that might have an issue with that are men who have had their prostate surgically removed for cancer and, and their nerve supply could have been damaged. But most men, that's not the issue. Uh, secondly, they have to have sufficient testosterone. I told men, you know, the penis is obviously an organ that is rich with testosterone receptors. You've got to energize those receptors. So you've got to make sure that their testosterone levels are adequate. Now here's a little known fact. Men do need some estrogen, and estrogen plays a role in sexual function. This is where I like to compare it to Goldilocks porridge. It needs to be just right. If the estrogen is too low, i.e. low five, they can actually have difficulty uh, starting an orgasm. If the estrogen is above 50, it will inhibit the, their orgasmic response. So you want to have estrogen just right. And as Elise mentioned, um, as men get older, especially if you get belly fat. There's an enzyme called aromatase that will turn testosterone right over into estrogen. So the typical man, age 60, 
has more estrogen on board than his wife. Because she's gone through menopause, he has belly fat, and he's making too much estrogen. So uh, they need to have the right level of testosterone and just the right amount of estrogen, not too much, not too little. So that's the hormone part. And then, of course, there's circulation. Um, as we age, we actually are going to develop microplaque unless we're um, very careful with our diet. And this is unfortunately where the United States is the lead uh, amongst all nations in ED. So we're number one, but not in the way we want to be. <laughs> so there's more ED in the United States than anywhere else. And I, I have to think it's due to processed foods and um, a fatty diet, a diet that's just not correct for us. So at any rate, one of the things I'll do, um, if a man has ED, they are actually at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So it's often a good idea to just check with the man. Have you ever had you know, a stress test or a, a cardiac calcium score to see if you've got blockages? Because if you've got blockages in the arteries down there, you might have blockages where it really counts, which is your heart. So that could be a very good part of the workup. Um, I've actually had men tell me that I saved their lives and I may be a little melodramatic, but they were very happy that we did the cardiac calcium score. Um, so the things that we can use for men, obviously we're going to check their testosterone and replace it in the ways that Elise mentioned, you know, either pellets or injections or topical. Um, and we're gonna make sure that their hormones are balanced. Um, so that's testosterone replacement therapy. And then just like we have the Femi wave for women, we have the gains wave for men. And we do use the same device. It is a shock wave device. And it looks like a little gizmo with a, looks like a little hammer. And it's a device that's actually was introduced to treat things like tendonitis and more musculoskeletal, but it's been recalibrated so that we use it in for sexual use. And so we basically are going to use this device. We have a very specific um, protocol where we go up and down the penis and we hit some of the arteries coming in. It's painless and it takes about 17 minutes. Um, and we recommend doing it twice a week for, this is what I tell my men, twice a week for three weeks if you have mild to moderate ED. Twice a week for six weeks if you have moderate to severe ED. Um, often men will notice an improvement after the first, or there are some men that don't really notice improvement until they've had a few more um, treatments. Now, a companion treatment to the gains wave is the one that we call the baby called shot. And this also uses the procedure. I've already described the PSRAC procedure. Um, we draw your blood, spin it down, harvest the platelet-rich plasma part of it. In the meantime, we've had the man uh, apply numbing cream along the shaft of the penis. Um, and we're using a little tiny, either 27 gauge or 30 gauge. These are our smallest needles. Uh, and then we're actually going to inject that PRP into the corpora cavernosum. Those are the erectile chambers that go on each side of the penis. And we also put a little bit in the uh, corona at the, at the tip uh, to enhance sensitivity and overall experience. Um, if we're gonna do the PRP shot, we always combine it first with the gains wave. And here's the reason why. The gains wave will create some temporary um, inflammation and the PRP shot, it is going to be attracted to stay in the area of inflammation. So it actually, doing the gains wave first enables the PRP to be more effective. And the other thing we always recommend if we're gonna do the PRP shot is we recommend that they get a penis pump. So this is not just something you find at the Adam and Eve stores. Uh, and just, you know, whatever, it actually is effective. And it's following the principles of plastic surgery. If you expand a tissue, the tissue can expand better. So the penis pump is applied at a minimum of 10 minutes twice a day, just to the edge of discomfort. So it actually creates a vacuum. It pulls that penis up into the pump and you wanna leave it minimum of 10 minutes twice a day, again, just to the edge of where you're a little bit of discomfort. Uh, at least a month longer is better. Uh, you can do it longer than 10 minutes, but that's the bare minimum. 10 twice a day, one month bare minimum. And that will help the uh, PRP shot work better. Now there are some men, this, you know, maybe they've been without testosterone for a long time or, or they've had ED for a long time. 
we will sometimes recommend that they get a second PRP shot uh, one to two months later, and then we're gonna really start to see the benefit. And just like the women, we will recommend that men come in once a year because they're still aging and you know these shots don't last forever nothing can last forever so we do recommend that they come in once a year and to get that kind of a booster shot um so both the prp shot and the gains wave are rejuvenatory um and we'll sometimes recommend that they do a whole series of gains wave along with the prp shot but you can do just the prp shot alone with that one gains wave session or you can do a set of gains wave. So they can each be kind of standalone therapies. So that's what we have to offer men. And of course, we also can put them on the Amcella chair if they are just terrified of needles and they don't want anything, you know, they don't want anybody looking at their their, their junk. Um, they can go in private and just sit on the Amcella chair. And we've had men with ED, um, tell us later that they walked out with an erection and they, Call their girlfriend and say, "Hey, I'm ready." You know, so it's a fun, it's a fun cheer to have in the office. Wow. I think that's great. Well, it really brings back the spontaneity in your relationship. You know, instead of having to take time to take uh, the little blue pill, you know, wait for that to set in, you're really ready anytime. And I think sit, sit 17 minutes with Gaines Wave is is worth that. I think they're they're wonderful, wonderful treatments. Um, now that we know some of the tre treatments you both offer, I'm wondering what are some very simple lifestyle changes men and women can take away today to maybe address any symptoms of sexual dysfunction? Elise, I would love to start with you. If there's any little little tips that, that the audience can take away. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the unfortunate reality is a lot of it can come down to how your body performs based on things like body weight, because that can really impact um, not only the blood flow to those particular areas, but it's going to potentially inhibit good sleep quality, which really impacts hormone levels. Um, and then, like I was mentioning earlier, excess body fat, unfortunately, causes hormone disruptions, and we do see it a lot in men. So, you know, it's a little redundant. We've all heard it a million times, but maintaining healthy eating habits and like Dr. Casebolt was mentioning, processed food, probably not your best friend for anything, but also this area of your life. Um, I really focus on whole food nutrition. So trying to eat food in its most natural form as frequently as possible, not saying anyone has to be perfect. I had custard yesterday don't feel bad about it, but you know, 80% of the time I try to be really healthy and mindful of the fuel I'm putting into my body. So I suggest the same for my patients. Um, being active, you know, again, really redundant. It's things we've heard for a long time, but when you get your blood flowing physically, um, you actually increase blood flow to those small areas. And then that's twofold. One, you're helping with blood pressure, blood flow, but then also weight maintenance. And Really a huge one that I push is sleep um, because that's when our body heals and repairs. And that's one of the only kind of natural things that men in particular can do to boost their testosterone is get that good solid REM sleep every night in our perfect world, at least eight hours. Um, but then another thing to add on is with that exercise, weight training has been shown to be really beneficial for testosterone. So in my male patients who might have a borderline testosterone who want to naturally increase it, those are always my two recommendations. It's weightlifting with exercise and good sleep. Um, and then another thing that I often talk about, uh, probably more with women, just because we're usually a little more open emotionally, is you know, you gotta think about the state of your relationship, your history, your thoughts on sex, and what that looks like in your life. Um, so sometimes it comes down to maybe you don't really like your partner that much either. And that can play a really big role. So I always like to bring in the hormonal, the lifestyle, and then of course that psychological or emotional element too. Really taking, I encourage my patients to take a look and we always ask the question of, okay, how is your libido? And if it's low, do you care? And then does your husband care? You know, you all have to, husband, wife, partner, whatever it is, you all have to be on the same page with the same desires. So, you know, I, I wish it was as simple as 
do X, Y, Z, and that libido will get better, but we're really complicated creatures. So oftentimes we have to address all different areas of their life. Absolutely. I want to add a little bit to that. Um, uh, I, I went to a lecture recently where the, uh, the guy spoke how important it is for men to have enough zinc. If you don't have enough zinc, a man can't make adequate testosterone and also vitamin D levels. Uh, vitamin D levels are critical. And this is also an area where if they are aggressively on a high dose of a statin drug, they're pushing their, their cholesterol down so low that they cannot make testosterone because all of these steroid hormones are actually made from cholesterol. So there are cases where people are on a lot of medications and sometimes that's the big reason for their low hormones or their low libido. You know, uh, SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft um, they're kind of famous for impacting libido. So we, we always have to look at that whole person, look at their lifestyle, look at their medications. And, and sometimes we can help them get off some of these medications with certain lifestyle adjustments and so forth. And also I've had women able to get off antidepressants when we started them on hormone therapy, they were like, oh, I realized I was just low on hormones. I'm sleeping better, I have more energy, my libido's up and I'm not depressed anymore. So we do see these amazing results from hormone therapy. That's wonderful. You know, we talked about so many great treatments tonight. How can patients determine if they're good candidates for any of these advanced treatments? Um, Dr. Casebold, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, so it's as easy as making a phone call. Uh, we actually offer free 15 minute uh, phone consults with either me or my nurse practitioner if you have some questions. And I can usually hone in pretty quickly, you know, if you would be a candidate or not. Um, I'll give you an example. I failed to mention, but with the Mcella, if you have had a hip replacement and you have a metal hip joint, you're not a candidate. So there's a few questions that we ask to see if you can qualify or, you know, I don't think there's too many other um, uh, things that you could not be a candidate for these other treatments, but that, that one popped up in my brain. Um, but really, most people are candidates, um, and so it just takes a phone call. Uh, if my front staff can't answer the phone, then they'll set up a time where either me or my nurse practitioner can, can talk, and we'll let you know. That's great. And then, Elise, how do you evaluate if, if people are right for, for BHRT? Um, we have a really wonderful call center that does a lot of that upfront education on what are what are your symptoms a little bit of your history and like dr case bolt said there's really not a lot that excludes people um of course certain medical histories a certain cancer certain procedures um you know whether you're a smoker or have been in the past that really determines what kind of hormones that you can safely do um but it is so much about just making an appointment and with us we have everyone get their labs drawn before we even talk to them so that way when they have their appointment we can really see and give them their options right away and we just use their history their current medication list um, with their lab results to determine exactly what would be best and you know, sometimes it's not as much about hormones as it is like the vitamin D or the Bs or improving their mood with um, certain supplements showing they were deficient in amino acids and stuff like that. So not a lot that completely excludes people from what we do in functional medicine because we look so much at the whole picture. Um, but we love new patients. It's one of our favorite things. And our call centers are really a great screen. And, you know, we just love what we do. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, ladies, before we end tonight, I would like to ask um, if you, just one tip that you would like our audience to take away from tonight. I know we discussed so many different topics for men and women, um, but one thing you would just like them to take away. Elise, I'll start with you. Um, one takeaway that, and this is speaking kind of from my experience with my patients, is that your sex life still matters, even if you've gone through menopause or, you know, you have had other experiences with your health. Um, it is always something that we can work to improve. And I do think it's a really important part of what makes us human and what makes life enjoyable. 
Um, so don't let your friends over happy hour tell you that they don't have a sex life and it doesn't matter because they don't care. Don't give into the propaganda because I do think it's very important for all of us to have a healthy sex life, whatever that means for you. Definitely. And Dr. Casebolt? I don't have a whole lot to add. I'm always um, encouraged and um, by the example of Suzanne Summers, you know, she's in, she and her, she's in her mid seventies. Her husband is in her, his mid eighties and they are very open about the fact that they have a robust sex life. Um, and she's gone on record as saying, I'll be on hormones until I die. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, if I have patients that are on the fence, I have found this really cute YouTube video. I just searched for Suzanne Summers it's about three minutes long, and she says, you know, if we were all on hormones, there would be more peace and less war. And I actually agree with her, because I think you feel really horrible if you're not on hormones. Um, I know for myself, I, I couldn't be still working if I didn't have my hormones. I've been on pellet therapy for 12 plus years, and I swear it gives me the energy, the motivation. Uh, I don't have the brain fog. It's just been a wonderful way for me to feel better. My bone density is better. Um, and I also want to bring out one of my mentors that I just love is uh, Dr. Berkson, um, D. Lindsay Berkson. She is a really foremost hormone scholar in the U.S. and she keeps abreast of all the literature. And she was talking about a recent study that the U.S. government actually funded. They looked at 7 million women who were over the age of 65. 1.5 million were on hormones, the other 5.5 million were not, which so they sort of served as controls. They looked at them over a number of years, and what they found, the women on hormones lived, on average, five years longer, which is astounding, because I don't know of any other drug or intervention that can do that. They had lower rates of dementia, lower rates of all forms of heart disease, and there were at least five cancers that they have lower rates, and this will shock women, but they had lower rates of breast cancer, ovarian, uterine, lung, and colon. So it is so much in our best interest to get on hormone therapy and stay on it. All of the data that purports to show that you should just get off it, you know, get off as fast as you can, is all based on a flawed interpretation of the Women's Health Initiative, which ended back in 2002, and it was just a flawed interpretation. So hormones are healthy for most women indefinitely. So I'm like Suzanne Summers, uh, in this regard at least, I don't ever wanna get off. I think it will help me live longer, more ha happier, um, and with a better sex life. So why, what, why not? <laughs> yes, and like you said, Elise, we deserve that. We deserve to feel good, to feel youthful, and to have a great sex life. Yeah. Ladies, I could talk to you both forever. Thank you so much for this great information. I hope it was helpful to our audience. Um, I would love to open up the class to questions from the audience, maybe for the next 10 minutes. We'll try to answer all of your burning sexual health questions. Here's a great one. Can I take hormone replacement therapy after a hysterectomy? And either of you can take that. Ideal candidate. Yes. Ideal candidate, okay. Absolutely. One of the um, bugaboos, one of the potential side effects, if women still have their uterus, is that we could stir up some bleeding. Uh, it's not necessarily serious, but going to be annoying. And if they don't have a uterus, we don't have to worry about that. We can dose them to the estrogen level that's right for their symptoms, and we don't have to worry about that particular side effect. So yeah, they are absolutely the ideal candidate for hormone replacement, for hormone replacement therapy. That's wonderful. Um, another person wrote in, are there any treatments for PE, which I believe is Peroni's disease? Uh, yes, the Gaines Wave and the PRP shot are fabulous. And we've had some great results. Um, we actually have a patient and his wife, they uh, live between here and Texas. And so they're kind of half time. And uh, they can, he comes in once a year for his PRP shot. Um, and he says we completely fixed his Peyronie's. Wow, that's, inc that's incredible. Because Peyronie's, I um, have heard, is very, very painful, even if you're not having an erection, very painful. Yes. Um, somebody wrote in, can taking prescription medications actually worsen my incontinence? Mm, depends on what it is. Um, yeah. There are definitely certain things that could 
um, like increase the diuretic effect and cause more urine to flow through the bladder, which could make that a little bit worse, more uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if Dr. Casebel has any other ones in mind in particular. The main one I thought of was a like Lasix or you know a diuretic. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the answer is yes. I think it would be more in that class of medication that just causes you to produce more urine. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, let's see, somebody asked, are there any at-home remedies to deal with vaginal dryness? There is a non-hormonal uh, cream developed by a gastro, um, gynecologist. It's called Jolva, J-U-L-V-A. Uh, we actually can order it on behalf of patients. Um, it can nourish the vaginal area. And also, here's a few women, for medical reasons, it's contraindicated that they be on estrogen for various reasons. Uh, you can actually get some vaginal rejuvenation with oxytocin. So oxytocin is a hormone that is released in large quantities after an orgasm, and it is called the cuddle hormone. It is what makes couples want to cuddle and hug after they've had sex. And it's a very wonderful feeling of having that release. Well, you can, uh, there are compounding pharmacies that make oxytocin and it can actually create libido uh, if you use it as a nose spray or as a trophy that dissolves under your tongue. But if it's made into a vaginal suppository, it can also nourish the vagina in a way that's not, has nothing to do with estrogen, but it can be really uh, helpful for women who for some reason can't do estrogen. Now that's not really an at-home therapy. You still have to see a doctor to order that, but the Jolva is completely over-the-counter non-prescription. Okay, that's great. Um, somebody just asked, what can be done for premature ejaculation? Ooh. <laughs> that one I don't deal with quite as much, so I don't have a right answer for that one other than testosterone replacement. I possibly heard that the PRP shot could help. Um, it's interesting, this coming weekend, my nurse practitioners and I are flying up to Chicago for an advanced training on PRP. For me, it's gonna be mostly a review. Uh, I do expect I'll learn a few new pearls, but the teacher of the course, we had to do a lot of prep videos and workshops and workbooks in advance. So I've gone through all that and she's had some really interesting uh, situations get better with that PRP shot. So um, it's, you know, I would try the PRP shot and just see it, it's not going to hurt. Um, it doesn't ever make things worse. So that, that's a possibility, but I, I, I'll ask for when I'm in Chicago this weekend and maybe I'll find out more. Okay, that's great. Um, what about nitric oxide and sexual response in men and women? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it is a very important part of sexual function because it's what causes the vessels to dilate and then that allows blood flow. So, you know, like we were talking about earlier with if you have heart disease and plaque formation or high blood pressure and blood can't get to those areas, sometimes nitric oxide can actually help with dilating those vessels in a way to improve something like erectile dysfunction. I haven't used it in women, so I'm mostly speaking about men. Um, so we usually increase it with natural lifestyle changes, but also there are certain supplements that can promote increased nitric oxide production, um, particularly those that are made from beets, which sounds interesting and kind of strange. Um, but there are certain supplements that have been shown to be effective at increasing nitric oxide, which then helps with you know, sexual performance. We actually have a little um, canister with test strips and we can have the patient put one end in their mouth, get it wet with saliva. And it depends on what color of pink it turns. If it's a light pink, they're deficient in nitric oxide production. If it's a dark pink, they're making plenty. So we do utilize a supplement that uh, is two capsules and it really is beet root. It's just dry beet powder. And I tell people, you can either eat beets every morning for breakfast or you can take the supplement. And, um, and then within 90 minutes of their first set of pills, 
we'll sometimes send them a little foil wrapped individual strip. They can check their saliva and they're, you're gonna see it turn uh, a deep pink. Um, and then I tell them, you need to continue the improvement by eating nitrate rich produce, which would be things like anything deep leafy greens, spinach, arugula, uh, even celery has some nitrate or beets. And I say, you've got to eat that for both lunch and supper. And obviously that's going to improve cardiovascular health as well. Um, and I also tell them, look, if you are using a medication like Viagra or Levitra or Cialis, this will make the medication work better because the medication depends on having adequate amounts of nitric oxide. That's how it works. It prevents the breakdown. If you don't have any to break down, it's not going to work. So you'll get more uh, results from that medication if you use the supplement and follow these lifestyle changes to your diet. That's great. I love that there's capsules. So you don't have to eat beets every morning for breakfast. Um, <laughs> I would never, ever be able to do that. <laughs> yeah. Get old after a while, for sure. Um, somebody just asked, is an overactive bladder the same as urinary incontinence? No. Um, they can share similar, I would say, symptoms. But usually incontinence is a lot of a structural or hormonal problem. An overactive bladder can be due to things like spasms. Um, so a little bit different mechanism. Now, I don't treat overactive bladder, so I can't say that exclusively. Um, but it's been my experience that they're, they're two different entities, even though some of the treatments might overlap a little bit. Okay. Now, I have found some women with overactive bladders are actually suffering from food sensitivities. So all, all functional medicine doctors know about food sensitivities and you know you could try them on either an elimination diet or do a food sensitivity test to see if there are certain foods. You know, caffeine could be an irritant, there could be other foods. Um, so there are things we could do about that, but I agree with her, it's not the same mechanism as incontinence. Okay, that's great. A uh, question came in, do you recommend progesterone after hysterectomy? Yeah, conventional doctors don't because okay. they'll tell women, look, you don't have a uterus, so there's nothing to protect. But right. I tell them progesterone is the natural balancer to estrogen, so you really do need it. Um, it probably has some breast cancer protection benefit, even some other cancer protection is good for the brain. Um, They've shown that if individuals have a traumatic brain injury or like a concussion, they do better if they're on progesterone. It's really good for the brain. If it's taken orally at that time, some of the components turn into support for the GABA neurotransmitter system, which helps with the restful sleep. Um, we have a topical that we uh, have available in the office if people wish to purchase that. So if it's topical, it doesn't have as much of the sleep restoring effects, but there are some women who get a hangover from, top, uh, from oral progesterone. So we, we have both, you know, we make both available. Um, but yes, I have just a few women who've had hysterectomies who tell me they just cannot tolerate progesterone. And so I don't bug them if they don't want to take it, but I do encourage it uh, for, for the many benefits that it offers. Definitely. Um, somebody asks, are there any cardiac risks with being on HRT or BHRT? There is really not, and that's a common misconception. Um, and so if anything, cardiovascular disease risk usually goes down um, because things like cholesterol improve, the elasticity of the vessels improves actually with estrogen. Um, and then oftentimes a piece of what improves cardiovascular health with hormones is just getting the energy up, um, getting people moving and more motivated. So then their weight maintains at a healthier level as well. So it's, um, if anything, it's cardio protective. Yeah, I would second that. Testosterone also improves nitric oxide production, which is definitely heart healthy. Um, yeah. And like she said, you feel better. You know, you get on exercise, you maybe have more weight, better weight management. Um, but it is a myth that uh, HRT or BHRT, whatever, uh, increases cardiovascular risk, it decreases it. 
Um, so I know you, uh, you both touched upon this earlier about uh, taking hormones and really being able to relieve uh, symptoms of depression and um, maybe a lack of sex drive. So uh, somebody wrote in, they said they've had major depressive disorder for a long time, um, zero interest in sex, no pleasure from sex. Um, how can hormones help and how quickly can you see those results? I know they probably vary by patient, but can you talk a little bit more about that? I've had, I'm sure she has too, I've had so many patients just say they have, they're a completely new woman and they almost come back in tears. I've had women come back and say, my husband wishes he could send you flowers because he got his wife back. Um, it's kind of amazing how much hormones impact our mood and our neurotransmitters. You know, it's interesting, hormones also have an effect on your microbiome, which is a little known fact, but the microbiome is all of your bacteria in your gut and they impact our production of neurotransmitters. Um, in fact, they make, more, they make more serotonin than our central nervous system does. And serotonin is our happy, calming neurotransmitter. Um, so I, I have had so many women tell me how much happier they are um, by us balancing their hormones. And of course, we also look at vitamin D, we look at B12, we look at thyroid. These are other common areas. We look at CRP levels to see if they're inflamed. And so when they come into the office for hormones, we're also addressing all of that. And so um, I think that's what helps our success in helping people with mood. Um, what do you have to add, Elise? Yeah, I was going to agree. I mean, I think um, a lot of women, especially if the depression started around some big hormonal shift time like childbirth or menopause, hormones are usually going to help significantly. You know, it's not the answer for everybody, but for a lot of women and men, it really is. And what I see being a very big contributing factor from a hormone perspective is definitely the thyroid. Um, so most people who either have an undertreated thyroid or have a thyroid disease and don't know it, their mood really suffers. And it's such a vague symptom that it can often go undiagnosed. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to say how long it would take for someone to feel better because it really depends on their individual issues. But I would say most of my patients end up being able to get off of an antidepressant and those that still need it, they're usually able to really decrease their dosing. So, you know, sometimes it's a combination of things. Um, I don't want to say everyone gets off of medication, but a lot of women, like I said, either get off or end up on a lot less, which helps them feel better too. Absolutely. Well, I think you both have given a lot of hope to men and women tonight and to couples. And I want to thank you so much for your time, your expertise on this topic. And also thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. We hope you um, found the information really helpful and useful. Um, if you would like to learn more about treatment options, please visit us at forumhealth.com or you can call us at 855-467-5922. Again, that's forumhealth.com, and our number is 855-467-5922. Um, also, in the meantime, connect with us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. We have tons of great content and videos on a variety of different health topics, so please make sure you connect with us there. And again, Dr. Casebolt, Elise, thank you so much, ladies, for tonight. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.